Good morning, colleagues. I'm so sorry I can't be there in person, but I am so glad that you can all be together as part of this Vision 2030, a roadmap for oncofertility research and practices that's being held this year in Pittsburgh. It is a new and exciting format for all of us as we come back from the COVID context and once again are able to be together uh, at McGee's Women's Research Institute. We've all been looking forward to this day, including me, um, but unfortunately my duties at Michigan State University have precluded me from being able to come. We are graduating over 10,000 students this week. Uh, and uh, so I am delighted to give this address and hope that I can see all of you at some point in the future. I wanna thank and acknowledge the extraordinary leadership of Kyle Orwig and Mahmoud Salama, who have uh, put together with teams of all of you who are in the room and, uh, and uh, all around the Oncofertility globe, uh, this particular meeting and have been leading the Oncofertility Consortium forward. Certainly as I have moved into my next role, uh, leaders have stepped forward and in particular Mahmoud now as the Oncofertility Director is taking the baton with each of you to develop the next generation of opportunities for families in the cancer setting and indeed in many settings where fertility can be threatening. Uh, the meeting really has fantastic speakers and we have a new way of working that includes this opportunity for Zoom engagement and dialogue. And I think that is a way of our future. But things that remain the same is that we continue to convene, we continue to learn, we are resource ready, no matter where we are around the globe. And I know that if I were sitting there, I would be seeing the names and faces of people who have been part of this community, who have led this community from our podium, from uh, many different vantage points, who have come together to build the next generation of opportunities for patients and uh, in education alike. And indeed, our Oncofertility Consortium is a global organization that brings us all together around the world. And I'm so proud of what we've been able to accomplish together. In preparation for this meeting today, I've had the opportunity to look back over about uh, 20 years of talks uh, in the Oncofertility area. And so today, it really is my privilege to kick off this Vision 2030 meeting with kind of a thought experiment going back to February 2020, just before this global pandemic emerged, where a group of leaders came together to consider what the future of oncofertility ought to be. And so with that in mind, let us begin this journey in this particular moment and with this particular talk. And if we think about our 2030 goal, our goal really is that the emergence of more and more treatments that will change in real time resulting in no more cancer. Uh, the uh, elimination of cancer as a diagnosis or the ability to change the life course following a cancer diagnosis is a goal of the Oncofertility Consortium. We also hope by 2030 that there will be full fertility, that there are interventional options to preserve fertility in all settings that you'll be talking about through this meeting, and that mitigation strategies will continue to emerge as associated with new clinical trials, that all of these uh, resources will be available across the globe, no matter what the economic uh, environment might be, and that all of the work as it emerges is con fully considered by all stakeholders, that our providers, our patients, the partners, and the public are all engaged as we are in the real change that is coming. Well, what is our frame for thinking and how did we think in that uh, those early days in February of 2020 about what would be coming ahead of us? We knew that the problems will change as we move towards 2030 and beyond, but we reaffirmed that our solutions require teams. We know that patients' needs are accelerating our pace because they're demanding more and more of us as we continue to develop this field. We know that innovations involve risk as we continue to build bench to bedside opportunities and that education at different length scales are really required so that we continue to educate fellows and physicians alike, that we have nurses together with bench scientists, that we continue to be co-educators of each other as we develop the next frame for our thinking. So what problems will we be solving as we move to 2030? Well, fertility needs will continue to uh, expand 
We've considered very heavily gonadal matters, but we also have to think of the reproductive tract and the uterus and other tissues or the nipple and reconstruction. These are all matters that patients and providers are concerned about. And we have to continue to, uh, um, to elaborate on what fertility and reproductive needs may be. We have to think about endocrine support, not just fertility matters. We have to think about pubertal transitions, the need for ongoing and durable cycles, the concerns associated with menopause and contraception. We have to think across broadly uh, different areas of engagement to, from humans to endangered and threatened uh, species to maintain the terrestrial diversity can in fact and does demand that we in our field use our knowledge to expand the opportunity spectrum for all uh, creatures on earth. We have to think about the transgenerational expectations of fertility uh, uh, as it relates to a grandparent uh, who has a, uh, a, a, a granddaughter or grandson who may be having fertility concerns thinking about the opportunities that exist and the ways we might manage fertility options. We have to think about new territories. This may sound odd, but as we think about what's happening in our future, we have to think about the Mars program and the NASA deep space programs. How does fertility continue to develop as we move beyond this terrestrial territory? And we also wanna think about ways in which autonomous error-free reproduction and replication continues to develop with an ethical eye in whose interest is this work done, under what auspices and what for what purpose. We need to continue to think as broadly as we can about the problems that we will be solving so that we do it in a manner in which it is in keeping with the original goals and intent of our consortium. Now, whose problems will we be solving? Well, we have moved older and older and younger and younger from adults to pediatrics. We've, uh, we've moved uh, across iatrogenic, genetic, and trauma-based uh, uh, fertility matters. We've thought about sexual minorities, those for whom fertility management must occur before the age of majority. And again, we've gotten, uh, we've worked through uh, younger and younger and older and older. And of course, within Access Grid and beyond, education, location, wealth, and attributes, all of which must be considered as we continue to evolve the field of oncofertility. And I think one of the things that we can rely on is our thinking that uh, all of these answers require teams. This goes back to the very first image of the Oncofertility Consortium when it was first funded. And it says that we have to blend our fundamental questions about follicle maturation and development and the fidelity of oocyte maturation uh, intimately to the uh, information silo spanners, those that help us build a common language between reproductive endocrinologists, uh, oncologists, new scholars moving into the field. And we have to think about the urgent unmet need that uh, the survivors uh, and individuals' parents and the expectations of family may have. So we've had to bring in multidisciplinary patient management boards. We've had to think about the legal, ethical, and insurance matters. And it's forced our scientific community to continue to think about new ideas and approaches. So thinking, continue to think in a 360 way will allow this field to continue to move from this diagram, which is now amortized by the very work you've done, to the work of your future. And we have to continue to build bridges. The National Physicians Cooperative and the Oncofertility Global Partners Network was really an extraordinary way in which we all worked together. We came together in ways that we couldn't have imagined uh, in the past. And so this map continues to be filled in with more and more individuals as part of this network with common purposes and knowing that no idea has to emerge from one particular geographic space, that the ideas must emerge from a common uh, set of questions. So what were some of the team targeted approaches that we took? Well, we had guidelines that came out across a number of different organizations. There was a journal that really, uh, um, that really augmented the kind of work that we did, uh, JAYO and JARG. We had shared best practices that were in multiple languages and those best practices were both written and website and through virtual grand rounds. We had a clear patient focus with the front line, my uncle fertility, cancer-friendly adoption agency lists and patient navigation that was virtual before virtual was a thing. 
we moved our technology at the pace of the needs of the patients. And that's something that has to continue as you move this field toward 2030. We've thought about emerging markets, thinking about the global network at the outset, thinking about pediatrics, sexual minorities, a nursing network and primary care, really making sure that we are touching across the width and the depth of the fields where patients' needs exist. And thinking about educational resources, when we couldn't develop, when we didn't have readily available some of the terminology for our patients, we've created a Reaperpedia. We created early childhood media. We created Oncofertility Academies. We created the Fellows Day. Where you need to educate, create that very material that is necessary to that education. And of course, we had funding and we want to continue to build out the funding as you move forward towards 2030. And the patient needs, as I mentioned earlier, really have accelerated our pace. It's a vibrant growing community. And of course, there is coordination costs with growth. So you must sustain your coordination and interaction. There's a penalty of additional um, of, of addition rather than new efforts, but I think that with the team field wide mission that we actually can in fact grow this community even larger. We wanna make sure that primary care, that first touch, the long-term relationships can be an influence mode. We want to bring more primary care into the Oncopertility Cons Consortium. There is a coordination cost. It's hardest to obtain from NIH, but with advocacy and philanthropy, I think this group can continue to convene as a group and we will, that coordination cost really needs to be part of the thinking. We have to think about advocacy, bringing together all the stories and really think about the ways in which these stories engage others and what the issue is for the work that is ahead. We have to continue to think about languages and culture and expectations. And the Oncofertility subcommittees begin to build out that shared values model. This coordination is still critical. Medical societies, fundraising, advocacy with governments and continuous medical education absolutely depends upon all of us being able to work together in this way. The field is maturing with large translational and clinical data sets that continue to provide op to opportunities for ongoing discovery research, continue to develop these opportunities for sharing of patients and bringing together the very uh, data that will be necessary uh, to be able to meet, to meet the uh, needs of 2030. And our fellows education, this is one of the most exciting ways in which we have built out the capacity to act for the next generation of leaders. And I've always been proud of the way that we've brought uh, education as a key feature of the Oncofertility Consortium. And of course, the fundamental science is continuing, uh, continue to drive this cutting edge cell biology, uh, bring conversations together so that the scientists know what the needs are and don't hesitate to try and develop those next generation of grants that will be necessary to the breakthroughs of tomorrow. Well, I think since this is perhaps my last talk, uh, uh, I will um, take a few moments just to tell you a few short stories about what I think we've learned in the last few years about the fertility and endocrine needs of, let's focus particularly on the pediatric cancer patients and talk for a moment about follicle maturation, high fidelity oocyte maturation, endocrine hormone production, that need for pubertal transition, and the cyclical hormones that are necessary to support health. Well, I think all of us know that to solve pro problems, we've had to embrace emerging technologies. And really thinking about the ovary at the very outset of the work that I did in collaboration with Lonnie Shea was to look at the structure function relationships between each of the individual follicles and the associated cells aligning to the maturation of an oocyte, which when released after ovulation can give rise to the embryo. But of course we could not grow these follicles outside the body at the outset. And so we hypothesized that perhaps the structural context really mattered to that developmental competency. If we could maintain these structures, these uh, precise relationships of the somatic cells to the germ cell, could we in fact have uh, the possibility for uh, a maturing oocyte? And so with Lonnie Shea, a biomedical engineer at Northwestern at the time, we developed this technology known as encapsulated in vitro follicle growth or EIVGF, which was to take ovarian tissue samples. This is one of the human tissue biopsies where you can see the small follicles 
And you can isolate follicles of all different sizes and categories from the primordial to secondary follicles. And those would be placed in this biological uh, material called alginate, which allows the follicles to um, uh, receive hormones from the outside, to remove waste into the media, and to grow over time. And Stephanie Pangus, one of the first graduate students to take advantage of this method, showed that you could take small follicles, place them into these alginate beads, and in fact, those follicles could grow and in fact, over time, produce the hormones, androgens and progestins leading to the accumulation of estrogen fully in vitro. And this had never been accomplished uh, with the, without the addition of exogenous androgens, showing that when one maintained the three-dimensional structure of the follicle, you indeed had a structure function that could uh, reliably produce all the hormones. And this was uh, fundamentally because the follicles were able to differentiate the two somatic cell compartments fully in vitro. Even when originally starting with the two, uh, two layer secondary uh, follicles, the somatic cells as they uh, developed a mitose away from the oocyte would begin to differentiate the interior cells into the inhibin producing granulosa cells and to transdifferentiate the outer theca-like cells that would produce the androgens. And this is the fundamental mechanism or reason that these steroid hormones could be produced when you maintained a three-dimensional structure that the somatic cells differentiated as they develop. This is something we didn't know before doing this work and has now opened up a whole new field of study of follicle maturation. Well, as the follicles grow, the oocyte, which again had two somatic cells originating uh, and in a central location, moves to an acentric location as the structure now continues to develop what in here is an antral space. And uh, if you actually provide to this follicle uh, HCG, chorionic gonadotropin, the luteinizing hormone, you can develop in vitro ovulation, one of the most extraordinary uh, 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 events in all of biology. And since it is one of those most extraordinary events, you can see the ovulation of the oocyte with the cumulus expanded coming out of these in vitro grown follicles. And one of the things that you can uh, see is that the follicle structure doesn't fall apart. There is a very specific region where um, the oocyte and the ovulatory mechanism occurs, something that we didn't know was autonomous to an individual follicle. And that is that individual follicles have all of the mechanisms necessary for ovulation, something we didn't know before this work. And that oocyte that is released is of sufficient quality to give rise to live healthy offspring, uh, which again was something that we thought could not be accomplished outside the body. But in fact, when you maintain that three-dimensional structure, the oocyte can be matured and give rise to live healthy gr growth. So through the last uh, two decades, through this work, we've been able to take primordial follicles through the graphene follicle stage have been able to get ovulation to occur. And then once ovulation occurs, the, os, the some remaining somatic cells then undergo luteinization in vitro and seal the uh, original hole from the ovulation and you have a full luteal structure. Again, something that we didn't know could happen outside the body, but the mechanism of luteinization is contained entirely within an oocyte, within a follicle structure. And so since we could actually get that full dimensionality of, of follicle maturation, um, we began to ask if we could mimic the overall endocrinology of these follicles entirely in a dish. And as you know, the menstrual cycle is, 13 day, is, is 26 days or 28 days in a human, about four days in a mouse. And there are complex interactions between the pituitary hormones and the precise regulation of the uh, hormones uh, from the ovary that then uh, are able to regulate the readiness of the uterus for an ovulated oocyte should fertilization occur. It also allows for the, um, for the um, cyclical change in the brain hormones so that there can be regular cycles. But these hormones are not important just to reproduction. They also condition the overall uh, body. Uh, every tissue in the body is responsive to the endocrine hormones, not just through puberty, but throughout life. Yet we do not study this interaction of the hormones uh, either in the reproductive cycle or in the overall body. And that's because we actually study all of biology in flat plastic, in Petri dishes. 
we eliminate that organization of the cells uh, between each other, like the somatic cells of the follicle and the, with the oocyte, and we never actually add the hormones of reproduction, neither male nor female reproduction. So we decided to try and change discovery research by eliminating um, the Petri dish from our laboratory, and in fact, developed a series of microfluidic systems that allowed us to grow either single tissues or two tissues or up to five tissues. And in fact, in work that will be released later this year, we can now do eight tissues, which allowed us to interact uh, tissues in ways that were more representative of the physical body. What you're seeing here are microfluidic uh, chambers with individual follicles. You might be able to see them in one of these structures. This is image under a dynamic flow with 10 follicles here growing in this microfluidic system. And when we're able to do that, we can get either individual follicles to grow and get ovulation on platform, or we can take the entire tissue and over a 30 day cycle, allow for ovulation and, uh, and luteinization. And so the, for the first time ever, we were able to develop a full 28 day cycle in a dish with ovarian follicles producing estrogen uh, under the influence of FSH. And then upon the triggering of LH, we have the conversion of that follicle to a full luteal structure and you see the progesterone now being produced. And we can do this either with single tissues and you can see the inhibin production only in the follicular phase and not in the luteal phase, just as you have in vivo. And as we put in additional tissues, such in this duet, the follicles now are both uh, producing hormones, but the downstream tissues are now also consuming hormones. So for the first time ever, this, bio this uh, technology has allowed us to uncover biology of the steroid metabolic pathway that had never been done before. When we put five tissues together in a structure we call the EVATAR, you now see this more uh, dramatically um, uh, elaborated with the estradiol now being consumed by downstream tissues, including the fallopian tube, uterus, cervix, and the liver. And that now opens up a whole new dimension of, of, of technology. One is that we can develop personalized drug testing for individuals as well as toxicological testing. And I think that's very important and many people will continue to work in this way. But what I would urge some of you in the room to consider is that we will be rewriting or you will be rewriting the signaling pathways that we've understood in cell biology uh, for the last 50 years. Those signaling pathways are all incorrect. They rely on individual cells that have been cultured for long durable periods of time, like breast cancer cells or uh, uterine cells on flat plastic. Uh, and they now have a signaling pathway that has nothing to do with in vivo biology. They have never seen the hormones of the cycle going up or coming down over a 28 day cycle. So our signaling pathways will have to be rewritten. And this is up to this field to take this technology and move forward. And I think because we have this signaling pathway, we will make new discoveries by integrating tissues together. We've only studied individual cell lines at a time on flat plastic. We've never looked at the way cells in our body integrate um, signals between each other. So there will be new discoveries through this kind of integrated cell biology on this platform. We will no longer be studying the biology of metabolic waste with cells sitting uh, and not able to actually metabolize um, the, um, the signals in a way that is at all like our human body. This is a new technology that is going to change radically how we perceive the work through 2030. So what I've shown you is that in fact, we can grow follicles and we've learned that the follicle unit is autonomous, that the growth and development of the oocyte is autonomous to the follicle structure, that luteinization, that ovulation and luteinization is autonomous to the follicle structure, and that we can show endocrine hormones in a 28 day human menstrual cycle period of time. And that those follicles or ovaries can control and um, regulate uh, downstream um, uh, tissues like uh, the reproductive tissues, but of course also like other tissues like liver, breast, and pancreas. 
We've also been able to adapt this technology to the human and shown on the bottom as a panel of human follicles that have grown over a 30 day period of time. And so now what I think we understand is that the follicle biology leading to live healthy birth requires a precise architecture, a relationship between the oocyte and the surrounding somatic cell, a precise environmental status, uh, the hormones need to be pr produced, uh, the pituitary hormones and the physical structure of the alginate maintains the physical structure of the uh, follicle unit. And of course, the hormones that we've always known were necessary um, to follicle biology. So this represents some of the work adapted to the human with the a human follicle and the oocyte now moving acentrically and a mature oocyte that um, this was the milestone in human uh, encapsulated in vitro follicle growth with the very first fully mature human oocyte grown in an encapsulated in vitro follicle growth setting. And um, Shuo, uh, Shuo did this work in an exceptional tour de force series of studies that I urge you to go back and, and read from scientific reports. This shows that you can adapt that mouse biology to human biology, and uh, there remains additional work to uh, increase the fidelity of the system, but the fact that you can get mature, oocyte, mature eggs uh, is a breakthrough in the field. Well, what makes, uh, how are, can we be confident that this oocyte is healthy um, prior to doing the, uh, all of the work of fertilization leading to live birth. Well, in collaboration with Tom O'Halloran, we actually made an extraordinary discovery about what makes a good egg. And that is that there is an accumulation of 20 billion zinc atoms in, an o in a mature oocyte at the time of fertilization. And then at fertilization, the zinc is released in what we now term a zinc spark. So this biological uh, new discovery, which I don't have time to go into today in this brief study, represents something that we had no idea was part of the maturation of an oocyte. Uh, and now we not only know that this is part of the biology and Tom and, and his group are continuing to develop uh, many of the um, uh, cell signaling systems that allow for this, uh, that necessitate this uh, zinc uptake during terminal oocyte maturation. But as you can see, it also provides an external signal to the oocyte, a non-destructive way that we can determine the quality of the egg. And so these are mouse uh, oocytes at the time of uh, activation. And we were able, together with uh, Emily Kay and Francesca Duncan leading the way, um, show that the zinc spark also occurs in fully mature human eggs, not those that are not mature. And so again, this technology now represents some of the most exciting new dynamic signaling pathways that had never been discovered before that now opens the way for all of you toward 2030. And in fact, this technology was identified as a major moment in human assisted reproduction and it traced the zinc, uh, the story of the zinc spark back to 1953 when the first use of sperm was, uh, was uh, elaborated in in vitro biology. And I had the great privilege of meeting Louise Brown pictured in this image on her 40th birthday. And in fact, she was aware of uh, our zinc spark work, which really shows that how quickly the field can move from the birth of uh, Louise Brown to her 40th, uh, 40th birthday to this zinc spark development really represents the pace of patient need that I mentioned earlier in my discussion. I will also notice, note that Jody Picot wrote a paper, wrote a book, A Spark of Light, based on this work, and I thought you might be interested in seeing that. So what makes a good egg? Of course, the chromosome's number and structure must be correct. The oocyte-specific gene expression must also have fidelity, but in addition, every good egg must sparkle. So if I return to the fertility and endocrine needs of our pediatric cancer patients, and of course we have over time in the Oncofertility Consortium collected biopsy of patient specimens, uh, and we've been able to isolate into fo individual follicles, as I mentioned, and of course Sherm Silber and others around the globe have been transplanting this tissue. But some of the tissue does in fact include the very cancer cells that that patient is trying to overcome. So transplant has been, in some cases, 
uh, is counterindicated. So Monica LaRonda some years ago began a developmental a project to try and uh, understand the ovarian scaffold as a way of developing new generation biomaterials that could be bioprosthetics, another term that we coined in the lab, that could be transplanted back into patients, potentially in the future when stem cells from patients can be programmed into both somatic and germ cells. And so she decellularized the tissue and began to describe this bioactive scaffold. And I, I believe she'll be talking more about that today. And she, together with Ramal Shah, began a process where we were able to take that very bioactive material, pulverize it, and make it into newly fabricated material like this paper, this ovary paper that can actually be folded into origami, but more importantly, can be used to place individual follicles that have been isolated away from the, um, from the circulating or tissue-based cancer cells. And that can then be sutured back into the peduncle. So what this demonstrates is that we have a bioactive scaffold but our goal is not to produce a single follicle that can actually be transplanted back, but actually replace the entire ovary, potentially in pediatric cancer patients who have had full sterile, uh, sterilizing treatment and are unable to have normal gonadal or uh, either ovarian or, or testicular function. So she began to look at this uh, tissue as a way of looking at the structure function relationships going back to that original concept that structure informs function. And in for, fact, um, demonstrated the cortex of the tissue is different than the medulla of the tissue. And so she began a 3D printing project to develop the necessary angles that would allow for the very first bioprosthetic or scaffold into which then she could place individual follicles. This was another Discover Magazine, Discovery of the Year. Three of these discoveries, discoveries have been placed in that context um, because they were really truly unexpected. So you can see the follicles now placed in a precise geometry of the struts of the bio of the 3D printed ovary. And in fact, the follicles take up residence and in vitro, one can again get ovulation to occur on platform. Now, this is the third time I've talked about ovulation on platform in different structures, either in individual follicles, in the evitar, or here in this uh, three-dimensional 3D printed ovary. Ovulation outside the body had not occurred before this. And so you see, we've now harnessed these technologies in multiple ways to ovulate uh, mature eggs. Uh, Monica then uh, placed uh, GFP positive follicles into this bioinspired structure. And one of the most important things is that in uh, the staining for the invading vasculature, these bioprosthetics very readily are revascularized uh, through mechanisms that I'm sure Monica and her lab and others will continue to develop. And that revascularization takes place much, much faster than uh, native tissue. And I think that's why then we have follicles that grow and develop. And in fact, after three weeks or eight weeks, two weeks, after, three weeks after surgery, or eight weeks, and again, this is a mouse which has a four day cycle, but you're seeing large mature follicles, the corpus luteum, the struts of the 3D printed follicles and subordinate follicles that represent the reason that these animals continue to cycle over and over. And these animals do in fact ovulate and uh, lactate, so maintain, um, the, uh, maintain their gonadal function. And uh, the GFP positive pump, pup represents the positive um, uh, evidence that these um, uh, bioprosthetics are able to uh, result in, in fully, uh, fully mat mature egg oocytes and live birth. So I've told you that a little bit of a story about um, our follicle maturation, going back to some of the beginning studies that we in fact have high fidelity oocytes that we can monitor through this new discovery of the zinc spark, that we have endocrine hormone production, not just of the uh, endocrine, not just of the follicular phase, but of the follicular and luteal phase. And those endocrine hormones can now be harnessed in new technologies that will allow us to study not only reproductive function, but all of, this, all of the organs of the body now as an endocrinology in a dish. 
Using that, we hope to be able to develop new technologies for pubertal transitions, allowing cyclical hormones to support uh, systemic health as these 3D printed bioprosthetics now are able not only to take up cells of the uh, cells that maybe um, have been maintained through our ovarian tissue cryopreservation program, but also through stem cells that are being developed uh, for individuals over time. Now, of course, I told you at the outset that we have to have 360 thinking, and the 360 thinking is that we can't just think about the bench. We have to think from the multiplicities of ways in which these scientific goals require us to ask and address hard questions. And I've been so proud of the Uncle Fertility Consortium for never stopping shy of asking the hard questions, legal concerns, religious constraints. Some of you will remember the ecumenical councils that we brought together to think about religious constraints, ethical discussions, the historical context. We have always educated and asked questions about how this technology developed. We never stopped short. So what I've been able to describe to you a little bit is the engineering of a field as well as the engineering of the reproductive axis. Together, we have engineered oncofertility solutions for young cancer patients through the work we've done by convening and working together. And we've developed new understanding of follicle maturation that's led to live birth and a whole suite of new knowledge about the follicle that we could not have known before. We've moved that into an engineered reproductive tract, the EVATAR and the lattice and beyond, allowing us to be the first to ever demonstrate a 30-day cycle in a dish, let alone the only tissue and tissue system to stay fully functional beyond three or four days, that is the typical amount of time cells are maintained in Petri dishes. And we've also used this to take the next step toward artificial ovaries by using the bio-inspiration of the skeleton of the ovarian tissue itself to 3D print the beginnings of next generation prosthetics. So all of this has been enabling to our 2030 goals. And as you move forward, move forward confidently, you will be able to develop the next generation of roadmap grants because you are interdisciplinary, because you are building the necessary patient registries, because you are educating and engaging, because you have leaders who care. You're building physician tools, patient management plans, clinical science that is multimodal, bringing basic science and ethics and the law together, having multiple uh, systems eggs and somatic cells, human and non-human, model organisms from mouse to worm to yeast. These are all next generation thinking. You need next generation training. And I think all of this together will enable every one of the goals as you look forward down the road. So I wanna congratulate every single one of you. Thank every member of this remarkable community. It has been such an honor and humbling to be a part of the Onco Fertility Consor Consortium. And together we can envision 2030. And I thank every single one of you for what you have done to make this field so vibrant.